Good afternoon and welcome to a talk on passive sampling for vapor intrusion. Um, this is a presentation for the MSECA conference 2020 uh, virtual webinar. My name is Todd McLary. I'm practice leader for vapor intrusion services at Geosyntec Consultants for the last 22 years. I've done work with passive samplers for over a decade. Did a five-year study of passive samplers for an ESTCP project. This is also my doctoral dissertation, so I know them quite well. Um, Brent? Yes, I'm Brent Poutler. I'm the customer service coordinator at uh, Serum. We're an environmental services laboratory, and uh, I manage the passive sampling service areas for uh, soil gas and vapor intrusion, as well as uh, pore water and surface water passive samplers. I received my PhD in environmental analytical chemistry from the University of Toronto. Heidi? Uh, thanks, Brent. My name is Heidi Hayes, and I'm the technical director at Eurofins Air Toxics. Um, I've been at Air Toxics for the past 26 years, and probably over the last 12 years, focused on passive sampling. And our laboratory has been in, involved in a number of the research projects um, evaluating the performance of passive samplers against the conventional air methods. And we've also supported a large number of the air programs utilizing passive samplers, including um, many of the vapor intrusion investigations. So while a growing number of vapor intrusion assessments are relying on passive samplers for measuring VOCs in air, Developing a project plan using these passive samplers can sometimes be overwhelming uh, due to either an unfamiliarity with the technology or perhaps just concern about regulatory acceptance. Now, pictured here on the right is a lineup of just some of the commercially available samplers. And navigating through the selection process can be pretty challenging. So in today's presentation, our goal is to share some practical guidance on how passive sorbents can be successfully incorporated into a vapor intrusion investigation. So I'm going to start with just covering some of the passive sampling concepts, how passive samplers work, um, how air concentrations are calculated, as well as benefits and limitations of the passive samplers. Uh, I'll also briefly cover some examples of commonly utilized samplers for indoor air and outdoor air measurements. Then I'll hand it over to Brent for a discussion of soil gas and finally to Todd to finish with a discussion on data quality and regulatory acceptance. So let's start with a discussion of what a passive sampler is and how it works. Now, passive sampler is simply a device containing a sorbent bed with an opening to the environment and either a diffusion screen or some sort of barrier at the opening. Uh, the passive sampler relies on fixed first law of diffusion to collect VOCs onto the sorbent bed. So that means that the molecules are going to move from a region of high concentration to low concentration. So the VOCs are moving from the surrounding air to the surface of the sorbent bed where the VOC concentration is essentially zero. So as long as that gradient is maintained, which means that that chemical is quickly absorbed by the sorbent and pulled out of the vapor phase, the rate at which that chemical passes through the opening is relatively stable. And this rate is referred to either as the uptake rate or sampling rate. Uh, the uptake rates are expressed in units of nanograms per parts per billion per minute or with a little bit of unit conversion and using the ideal gas law in units of mils per minute. So you don't actually have an active flow rate where volumes physically pull through the sorbent bed, but you can look at this uptake rate as kind of a diffusive flow rate. Now, theoretical uptake rates can be calculated using Fitts law and assumption of uh, zero concentration boundary at the sorbent surface. Now, the ideal uptake rate is calculated using the effective diffusion coefficient, and that's chemical specific, as well as the geometry of the sampler, which is this component here in this equation. So A is the cross-sectional area of the sampler. So in this diagram, this would be our cross-sectional area of the opening, and L, which is the diffusive path length. And this relationship is very intuitive. The larger the cross-sectional area, area, the higher the uptake rate, as well as the smaller the diffusive path length. So the, the shorter the path to travel, the higher the uptake rate. 
So the key here is that the geometry of the sampler does play a pretty significant role in the sampler's uptake rate. Now, in order for that uptake rate to re remain stable, we need to stay in this kinetic region where the VOC molecules are continuing to be pulled out of the vapor phase and accumulate on the sorbent. So once we start approaching this uh, state of equilibrium, uh, the VOCs are being released back into the environment. So we're encountering either back diffusion or sometimes called reverse diffusion. And at this point, we no longer have the zero concentration at the surface. The uptake rate as we move across this time will drop and uh, we no longer have a uh, stable uptake rate. Uh, chemicals which are weakly retained on the sorbent, so for example, high vapor pressure compounds, um, are highly susceptible to back diffusion, especially as you move across um, with increasing time. So this is a key part of passive sampling. You want to make sure you have the proper selection of sorbent for a given chemical, so we're keeping that sampling in this kinetic zone. And we also need to be aware of the appropriate time interval um, in order to keep that uptake rate stable and generate reliable results. So, <clears throat> using uh, this uh, uh, kinetic condition, the concentration of the VOC in the air can be calculated just using this simple equation. So we've got concentration equals the mass uh, on the sampler divided by the uptake rate multiplied by the time, the time that sampler's been deployed. So the laboratory will measure the mass on the sorbent bed, and that's generally in units of nanograms or micrograms. And this will be uh, prepared by either solvent extraction or thermal desorption, and analysis will be conducted by GCMS. And then to calculate the concentration in units of mass per volume, we're going to take the uptake rate in mils per minute, and the time duration in minutes, and we end up with units of mass per volume, do some unit conversions, and we can generate a concentration of micrograms per cubic meter. Now, mass can be measured very accurately in the lab. Uh, the time measured in the field for deployment, again, very accurate measurement. So really the key to a successful concentration uh, calculation is this uptake rate. So fortunately, there are a number of experimentally validated uptake rates that have been generated and published for commercially available samplers. Um, experimentally validated uptake rates are generated using environmental chambers, which are pictured here. Uh, we've got the samplers here in this carousel, um, and they're going to be placed inside this chamber. We will then uh, meter out these calibration gases into the chamber expose the samplers to a known concentration. And then we can also change the environmental conditions um, that the samplers are exposed to. And this will allow us to generate an, an a, uh, empirically derived uptake rate based on a range of environmental conditions. However, it's not uncommon that a specific chemical of interest may not have a published uptake rate. In this case, we could use a calculated uptake rate using the uh, ideal uptake rate that we talked about several slides ago. Um, if the chemical behaves ideally with optimal retention on the sorbent during the sampling interval, that uh, ideal uptake rate can predict pretty reasonably what that concentration is. Um, it can provide some good estimations. However, if that real behavior deviates significantly from the ideal behavior, there could be a low bias introduced. And I think as a rule, it's recommended that concentrations calculated using uptake rates which have not been empirically verified should be qualified as estimated just because the level of confidence in the uptake rate is lower. Now, another approach to using chambers to generate uptake rates is to determine a field validated rate. Now, this is accomplished by collect collecting active samples. It could be a canister or sorbent co-located with a passive sorbent sampler and using that active concentration to derive the passive sampler uptake rate. Now, this approach can also be used to verify the performance of the passive sorbent sampler's published uptake rate under field conditions. So now we've covered how passive samplers work and some of the key concepts related to their success. 
uh, why is this tool of interest for air monitoring professionals and vapor intrusion practitioners? Well, one of the most appealing advantages of passive samplers is their ease of use in the field. And if we look at the conventional air sampling alternatives, TO15 and TO17, uh, these advantages are, are pretty clear. If you look at TO15, the sample collection requires assembly of the trains, checking for leaks prior to sampling. Um, sampling can be compromised if the canisters lose vacuum during transport and storage, or if fittings or valves or flow controllers leak during collection. Um, additionally, the flow controllers here at the top can uh, fail, either leak uh, during sampling or fail to maintain the calibrated flow rate. So we here at Air Toxics do handle hundreds of canisters a day. We have a whole uh, system of checks to make sure that the equipment is functioning before it leaves the laboratory. However, even with the most diligent checks and the most experienced field um, technicians, you can still have failures in the field. Now, if we look at TO17, this does require uh, flow calibration of the pump, um, it requires power as well, and over a long period of time, we need to make sure that flow rate is constant, so changes in flow rate can also compromise the sample collection. Now, by contrast, we've got passive sorbent methods. Um, essentially, sampling uh, occurs by simply exposing the sampler to the environment, and that there's no mechanical equipment, there's no calibration, it's just relying on diffusion and fixed law to collect the sample. Uh, training is uh, very minimal, minimal, and it's very reliable in terms of its performance. The samplers are very small and unobtrusive, which means that they are also inexpensive to ship. And a pitcher is worth a thousand words. Here's a picture of 72 six liter canisters getting ready to go out in the field for a field activity. Um, probably would require a cargo van to transport those to the field. And then here to the right, we have a picture of 72 passive samplers can fit in a bin and fit in the passenger seat of your car. So clearly, in terms of logistics for some of these very large air sampling programs, the passive samplers are, are much easier to work with. Now, in addition to the practical advantages, they, there are several important technical advantages as well. Uh, specifically, the ability of passive samplers to measure long-term integrated VOC concentrations on the order of weeks as opposed to hours and days, as is the case with TO17 and TO15. Now, if we look at TO17, uh, TO17 has both volume and flow constraints. So we need to be concerned about maintaining constant flow, and if we exceed the safe sampling volume, we can have breakthrough of our compounds and we're no longer generating accurate results. So in general, TO17 is limited to sampling periods uh, up to about 24 hours as, as a maximum time. Uh, TO15, the constraint with TO15 is basically the mechanical flow controller. These flow controllers become less reliable once we hit these ultra low flow rates, flow rates less than one mil a minute, which would be required to fill a canister over an extended period of time. So in general, um, canisters are used for about three days and it starts to become marginal as we start to approach seven days. Um, the most common sampling duration for TO15 is 24 hours. Now, extending the um, uh, sampling period to, uh, to uh, I'm sorry, extending the sampling interval is a particularly of interest when evaluating indoor air concentrations at vapor intrusion sites. Um, these have been found to vary greatly over the course of an investigation. Um, you can see here in the graphs, we can see a wide range of concentrations over time. Um, researchers monitoring indoor air quality continuously have found that indoor air concentrations can vary significantly uh, between days and also seasons. So if you're looking at a single indoor air sample collected at a random point in time, this may not be representative in evaluating the human health exposure. So the practice, both historically and currently, has been to collect multiple indoor air samples to estimate long-term average exposures. Um, these are generally 24 hours, as I mentioned. However, there is increasing interest in using methods which can measure over a longer period of time on the order of weeks to better estimate chronic exposures. And to provide some perspective, if you look at the radon industry, 
uh, a 90 day sample is referred to as a short term sampler. So you can select your passive sampler to uh, sample on the order of hours, but you can also extend them if you select the proper uh, geometry and sorbent to time periods even beyond 14 days. Now, in addition to being able to provide long-term time integrated measurements, uh, passive sorbent methods are also capable of reporting limits comparable or even lower than TO15 SIM. Uh, we often think of diffusion badges in the context of industrial hygiene, uh, looking at worker exposure for a single compound. And in general, that's OSHA limits in the PPM range. However, with the recent sampler configurations and some of the associated analytical techniques, we can do multi-component target lists and also achieve subpart per billion reporting limits, which are suitable for environmental monitoring applications. So the next question is, are passive sorbent methods a good fit for your program? And it's important to remember that there's no one tool that's appropriate for all monitoring requirements. So I just wanted to walk through some of the considerations to determine whether passive methods could be used either to replace or even supplement conventional methods like TO15. So looking at the matrix, uh, passive sorbent methods can be used to measure VOCs in indoor air, outdoor air, sewer gas vent pipes, and can be even used at, to generate quantitative measurements for soil gas. And Brent will be covering this in more detail shortly. Uh, the next consideration is whether these passive sorbent methods um, can meet your project objectives in terms of your compound list. Um, if your site is uncharacterized and the goal is to, um, to try to understand and measure a large number of VOCs, including uncalibrated compounds. Um, the passive sorbent methods are generally not a good fit. Um, unlike TO15 or TO17, where VOCs can be quantified, as long as that compound is in the calibration mix, um, the passive sorbent methods also require an uptake rate. Uh, we could calculate some uptake rates. Um, however, these concentrations will be qualified as estimated. And this may or may not meet your project objectives. Um, in addition to some unavailability of uptake rates, we have some challenges in terms of the uh, volatility range that the passive samplers can measure. So both ends of the VOC range can be challenging for passive samplers. The VOC, the very volatile, um, which would be less than C3, um, are challenging because these compounds are not well retained on the sorbent, which means that the time interval where we have a stable uptake rate can be very short depending on our sorbent so that for long-term monitoring it can be challenging for these very volatile compounds. Compounds like methane um, are not retained at all on sorbents for these methods so methane cannot be used for a passive sorbent method measurement. Uh, vinyl chloride can also be challenging for long-term monitoring um, because of its high volatility, it's not well retained over long periods using high uptake rate samplers. Additionally, it can be challenging to measure semi-volatile compounds, com compounds that are greater than, say, C12, uh, due to poor desorption off the sorbent, as well as they're not designed for particulate uh, phase measurements. So the sweet spot for passive samplers are in this targeted VOC range um, of similar volatility. For example, at a chlorinated site, focused on PCE and TCE, or perhaps a petroleum impacted site following uh, where we're interested in BTEX. Um, there are a number of sampler configurations and sorbents that perform very well for this suite of compounds. And finally, what is this planned sample collection period? You know, obviously one significant advantage that we just talked about is the passive sampler's ability to collect long-term measurements. However, there are sampler configurations that can be deployed on the order of hours while ger generating trace level reporting limits and others that can be deployed on the order of four weeks. However, if you are trying to do grab samples or real-time measurements, um, uh, clearly the passive method is not an appropriate approach. So once you've decided that the passive samplers could be an option for your project, what next? So deciding on the proper sampler can be overwhelming as there are a number of geometries to select from. And each of these geometries can be paired with various sorbents. 
In terms of geometries, we have the axial geometries, which is the tube here and the badges, two different badges. Uh, we have the radial style, which is pictured here. And then we also have the uh, permeation sampler. So the tube has the lowest uptake rate, uh, followed by the badges, and the highest uptake rate is the uh, radial. And there are a, a range of uptake rates that can be used for the permeation sampler, the WMS sampler, uh, depending on the configuration. Now, in terms of uh, sorbents, VOC passive samplers can be configured with either charcoal or um, thermal desorbable sorbents. Charcoal sorbents are characterized by very high surface area and strong VOC retention. So this requires a more aggressive solvent extraction preparation technique to desorb the VOCs. Um, thermally desorbable sorbents are weaker sorbents, and they're amenable to thermal extraction preparation techniques. So the solvent extraction technique results in lower sensitivity, so several orders of magnitude lower, as compared to thermal desorption. However, because of its stronger retention characteristics, the deployment time can be significantly longer as compared to the same geometry paired with a thermal desorbable sorbent. So this means that the lowered analytical sensitivity from solvent extraction can be offset by longer deployment times in the field. Now, with all these choices, there are some general guidelines on passive sampler configurations based on matrix uh, to simplify project setup. Uh, Todd's going to cover these guidelines in more detail uh, later in the presentation. But it is helpful to partner with an experienced lab and discuss your objectives, the matrix, the target compounds, reporting limit objectives, and your desired sampling interval, just to make sure that you've selected the proper sampler um, to generate some reliable results. Now, there are a number of configuration options, as we just mentioned. Uh, I wanted to go through some sampler configurations that are commonly utilized for indoor air as well as outdoor air monitoring. So to meet the low indoor air screening levels required for vapor intrusion investigations, the radial sampler is often selected as its radial geometry translates to that very high uptake rate. So we're pulling a lot of mass from the environment onto the sorbent bed, and that will generate low sampling reporting limits. There are two cartridges that are available. One's called the RAD145, and this is a thermally desorbable sorbent. This is paired with a yellow body. And then we have the RAD130, which is an activated charcoal a cartridge requiring solvent extraction. So here's the picture of the cartridge, and then we've got the diffusive body and the triangular stand. So for the shorter durations of 70, uh, 24 to 72 hours, the RAD145 is optimal. We've got a highly sensitive thermal desorption technique, generating very low reporting limits for these shorter intervals. However, because the sorbent is weaker, back diffusion starts to compromise performance um, as we start extending these periods to longer intervals. It's these extended periods of seven days or longer where we can start moving over to the RAD 130. Um, and this is a more optimal solution for these longer time periods. Um, the solvent extraction technique doesn't generate the analytical sensitivity. However, the high uptake rate with a strong sorbent generates low reporting limits at these long sampling intervals. So this table does a good job of kind of comparing these samplers. We've got the RAD140 thermal desorption for 24 hours. We've got the seven day RAD130 solvent extraction for seven days. And we have the conventional TO15 SIM reporting limits. And you can see the 24 hour uh, RAD145, the seven day RAD130, and the TO15 SIM all line up pretty closely. In fact, the passive radiellos generally um, generate a reporting limit better than what we can get with a TO15 SIM. A couple other considerations for your selection. Um, when you're looking at RAD145 versus RAD130, the RAD130 does have a more comprehensive a compound list with uptake rates. It's a stronger sorbent um, and it is more compatible to retaining compounds, um, uh, a larger number of compounds than the weaker RAD145 thermal desorption sorbent. 
Uh, secondly, if you expect to encounter high concentrations of either target or non-target VOCs at your site, the RAD-130 does provide some advantages. The uh, RAD-130 charcoal has very high adsorptive capacity and it is less prone to overloading the tube and perhaps competitive adsorption effects than the RAD-145. So if you're sampling at, a, say, a warehouse and you have a high concentration of maybe a solvent that's being used, um, if you're using the RAD-145, you could perhaps um, compete for sites with this high concentration of non-target and your target compounds, for example, TCE, may be um, competitively desorbed and we end up with a low bias. So that would be a circumstance where the RAD-130 would be a better selection given that uh, presence of high concentration of your non-target VOC. Uh, the TCE would be well retained even in the presence of a high concentration solvent. So I also wanted to go through um, how these radiello samplers have been utilized for indoor air measurements. There are uh, quite a few projects to select from, but I wanted to focus in on Region 9. Uh, Region 9 was involved very early on in evaluating passive sorbents um, for indoor air investigations. And they uh, performed a valuation study at Moffett Field and Orion Park um, and put the uh, information together in a presentation back in 2010. And they found good comparability with a 14-day Radiello 130s and TO15 SIM. And their conclusion was it was a very easy tool to use, and they encouraged the use of passive samplers as another tool in the toolbox for monitoring VOCs and indoor air. Um, they also encourage the use of non-EPA or alternative methods like these passive samplers in the work plan and working with the regulator um, to use these tools for vapor intrusion investigation. So they early on, they were reviewing this technology and uh, found good comparability. And as a result, the technology has been used um, at several Superfund sites over the years. Uh, one in particular, very large scale project where over, th well, nearly 3,000 radiello 145 samples were deployed in indoor air in people's homes, collected for 24 hours. And the compounds of interest were a subset of chlorinated VOCs. At the same site, about 300 radiello 130 samplers were deployed and collected for seven day intervals. Um, so that's an example of a very large scale project um, that passive samplers were successfully used they are able to get a large amount of data very quickly and efficiently with this technology. Now I wanted to move uh, and talk about ambient air measurements a little bit. Uh, ambient air monitoring programs, generally EPA 325 was a relatively new, newly promulgated method um, from the EPA, uh, is often the choice for ambient monitoring programs. It uses an axial style, a tube style that's packed with a single bed sorbent. Now this method was promulgated really to support uh, the refinery uh, sector rule and update to the refinery sector rule that requires fence line monitoring at every refinery in the U.S. Um, in this case it's specifically for benzene but the method can be used for a number of DOCs. Now due to the lower uptake rate of this geometry the reporting limits are higher than its radiello counterpart uh, for sampling intervals of 7 to 14 days is shown here. So I've got BTEX shown here, um, and the reporting limits are consistent with TO15 full scan reporting limits at about 14 days for the BTEX suite. Um, and again, EPA 325 is being utilized across the U.S. Uh, to support the fence line monitoring at all the petroleum refineries. Now, at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Brent to discuss using the passive sorbent samplers for uh, soil gas measurements. Excellent, thank you very much, Heidi, and thanks for that great uh, introductory to passive sampling in general. Uh, I'm gonna focus in on the application of passive sampling for quantitative passive soil vapor monitoring and discuss some of the challenges behind it and uh, how they were overcome. So as Heidi had introduced uh, very elegantly uh, 
There's, uh, in terms of traditional or conventional sub-slab or soil gas monitoring, you're likely used to seeing something like this with an active uh, SUMA canister present, where essentially, whether it's a sub-slab or with a geoprobe that's used to uh, create a soil gas well, uh, it gets connected and it's actively drawing air up through the different surface, uh, through the different uh, locations. And as you can see, if this is somebody's home or somebody's place of business, uh, these are actually quite obtrusive and can uh, really uh, affect uh, business or how you're able to use uh, your home effectively during these types of studies. And as Heidi had also introduced, there are a lot of uh, QAQC considerations uh, that you do need to take into consider, uh, consideration when you are doing these programs. In terms of, you know, these thing, these canisters and techniques are prone to leaks. Uh, you have to do things like vacuum testing, permeability testing, there's helium tracer tests, sample screening, and there are a whole bunch of uh, different methods that you would potentially have to choose from depending on what your ending uh, your end goal is. So really there has to be an easier way to getting these types of uh, results for uh, soil vapor monitoring. And basically the key point is, is these can be uh, labor intensive, uh, there are multiple fail points and there is uh, lots of equipment that you're having to truck out to the field. So in terms of passive soil uh, gas sampling, uh, here's an example uh, using a particular method. And you see, I've got the comparison of the active sampling versus passive sampling. And uh, if there weren't these diagonal lines here, you would likely look at this and really see that there isn't much of a correlation at all. Ideally, uh, for the, uh, the active sampling to be considered quantitative or uh, accurate, it would be in good agreements along the one-to-one -one line with uh, the passive technique. So the passive for it to be, it would match up quite nicely with the active. So because of uh, these types of studies that have been done, it led to some conclusions being drawn, basically saying that you cannot get concentration of a contaminant in soil gas using passive sampling techniques. However, you know, people have been bearing sorbents in the ground for three decades, and there's been a limited ability to, to quantify soil vapor concentrations. So we wanted to seek out and try to understand why this is the case and see if this is something that could be overcome. Now, the reason why uh, soil gas uh, is difficult to quantify is that um, you really have to control the sampler uh, uptake rate so that you avoid what is known as a starvation effect. So if you look at this uh, cartoon drawing here, where the sampler uptake rate is higher than the supply of vapors to the sampler. So what this ends up doing is it uh, causes a localized depletion in the vapor concentrations, and it effectively starves the sampler. Now, if you're able to design a sampler where the uptake rate is lower than the supply of vapors, then the sampler will not become starved and you know, there's uh, ample supply for it to be taken up and then you can actually get an, an uh, accurate uh, time-weighted average concentration over the time of deployment. So this is graphically, this is what the starvation effect looks like where you've got your passive sampling concentration appears to be much lower in comparison to the active sampler. So setting out to try to understand why this is a particular case, there was a lot of math that was done. And really, I'm not going to go over all of this different math, uh, but the key points to take away is that in dry soils, uh, there, there's relatively quick diffusion, you know, on the order of about 10 minutes, where in wet soils, it can take longer than one day. And the diffusive delivery rate for the sampler is usually greater than one mil per minute, except in very wet soils. And then in wet soils, you know, a lower uptake rate is really needed to avoid the starvation effect, but this can be reasonably predicted. So knowing this, and around uh, the early, late 2000s, there was the uh, advent of what is known as the Waterloo membrane sampler. And this sampler could be ideal for uh, soil gas studies because uh, it is a relatively simple sampler to work with and deploy uh, 
it's a glass vial that is filled with some absorbent and is equipped with a PDMS membrane. And so the molecules from, from the uh, vapor phase go and they diffuse through the membrane and they get taken up into the absorbent. Now these blue arrows are meant to represent uh, water molecules and this PDMS membrane actually repels water. Uh, so this actually makes it a very good candidate to be deployed in these uh, humid type environments such as soils because uh, the sampler will not be swamped with water molecules overall. Now, in terms of sampling procedures, as Heidi had gone over, it's very simple to deploy and use. And so you get the sampler sent to you in this vial here. You open this overpacked vial to start sampling and to essentially stop sampling, you pack it back in here and then you ship it off to the lab. And then you can see here how they can be deployed with these custom design hangers and then hung uh, from the different uh, in the different uh, configurations possible, and Todd will go over some of the uh, sampling considerations and field deployments. And we've got some excellent videos on YouTube uh, that shows the uh, talks about the different samplers as well as shows the overall uh, deployment. Now, in order to achieve quantitative passive soil vapor, uh, as I had mentioned, you needed to avoid the starvation effect, and this can be done by fine tuning the passive sampler. So by taking the WMS sampler, the standard configuration, and either changing the size of the surface area to which the vapors are exposed, which is that A term that Heidi had, had spoken within the, uh, that uh, fixed law of diffusion, uh, you are lowering the uptake rates uh, to prevent the starvation. Or another way in which you can do it is by increasing the path length or the thickness of the membrane. And by increasing the thickness by about 10 times, uh, the uptake rate is slowed by about 10 times. So by changing and doing these uh, different configurations of the WMS, you see from this side-by-side -side comparison of passive sampling concentrations versus active sampling, we get very good agreements along the one-to-one -one line for indoor air, uh, as well as outdoor air, which is buried within here. And then you see for the first time, we're actually able to get quantitative results from soil gas as well as sub-slab uh, concentrations using the water membrane sampler. And all this work uh, was done and then it was patented. Uh, and there's a couple of patents used for this work. So if you are interested in doing quantitative uh, soil gas sampling, the water membrane sampler is the way to go. Now, in terms of soil gas me measurements, as we discussed, there are these different configurations available and they are each optimized uh, to, depending on whether you're wanting to look at sub-slab or porous filled material. So what is known, what was considered more of a standard dry soil material, wetter clays, we've got a, that thicker membrane material, as well as SVE vent pipes, you can likely get away with the, the standard water membrane sampler. The key point here is to speak to somebody if you're not sure which configuration works best. You can reach out to uh, us here at Serum, or you can speak with uh, your laboratory and Heidi, for example, as somebody that can really help you in designing your uh, overall uh, field campaign. Now, in terms of some of the soil gas sampling and data presentations, I just I like showing this example here for a suite of chlorinated solvents where I've deployed. Uh, these samplers over this grid pattern over my site. And then you can create these heat maps where you can see areas of high concentration of PCE and TCE to help you understand uh, the different areas of your site where you'll need remedial action. And then you can hone in further and do uh, higher frequency samples, or you can figure out which areas you need to focus on getting short-term duration samples by TO15 or TO17, for example. But then you can also go through and look at your different degradation products and understand sort of how these compounds are potentially degrading at your site and where the degradation are going. And I also like to show here that we do get very good results of vinyl chloride, a compound that is uh, typically uh, quite tricky to uh, utilize or to get accurate uh, results from a passive sampler. 
Uh, there are many resources that are available for the WMS. I point you to our website here as well as our YouTube videos. And there is a, a serum seasonal newsletter and the focus of the uh, last autumn's newsletter was in fact on passive sampling for air monitoring. So I encourage if you are interested in more information to visit any of these resources uh, that are freely available on the web. And with that, I will pass things over to Todd to speak on sampling considerations, QAQC, and regulatory acceptance. Thanks, Brent. So on to our next topic area. Heidi mentioned a little bit that before you begin a program, you need to consider which sampler you're going to use, what sorbent is going to be used with that sampler. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the scope of you know where the samplers may be applied. Um, when it comes to sampler selection, it's best if you can find a sampler that's already got published uptake rates for all of your compounds of potential concern. Um, but if not, you could consider field calibration. Um, also, if there are two compounds that are very similar to one another, they should have a similar uptake rate. Um, so sometimes you can draw uh, inferences as to what the uptake rate ought to be. Um, if there's, you know, a strange compound that's for none of the passive samplers have a calibrated uptake rate for. Um, your uptake rates need to be high enough to give you uh, desired reporting limits in a reasonable sample duration. If you have a very low uptake rate, you need a longer sample duration to get to a target uh, reporting limit. And so there's some uh, consideration for when you're dealing with indoor air sampling, for example, where the target concentrations are very low, you generally want to have a higher uptake rate sampler. Um, but also you want to have rates low enough to minimize starvation, and that's more important where your airflow is minimal, um, for example, in soil vapor sampling. Um, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, you need to think about it a little bit before selecting the appropriate sampler. And even within different categories of sampler, there are different configurations. Um, some samplers come with an uh, uptake rate uh, cap that minimizes the uptake rate. Um, others, as the water membrane sampler, have different you know, membrane thicknesses or opening sizes, et cetera. Uh, when it comes to sorbent selection, if you are planning to sample for a long period of time, it's good to use a strong sorbent. For shorter periods of time, you may be able to get by with a weaker sorbent. Um, the analysis by solvent extraction is required for the stronger sorbents, but you can use thermal desorption for uh, the weaker sorbents. Um, with solvent extraction, you might use a milliliter of solvent to extract the sorbent, but you might only inject a microliter, in which case most of what was absorbed never makes it to the analytical instrument, and that results in somewhat higher reporting limits. Um, whereas with thermal desorption, everything that gets sorbed gets into the uh, GCMS machine, and that can give you better sensitivity. So there's uh, some pros and cons between selecting between those two. Uh, and not every chemical is as well suited to uh, solvent extraction or thermal desorption. Uh, the stronger sorbents are not so good with really strongly sorbed compounds, but they're better with weakly sorbed compounds and vice versa. The thermal uh, desorption compounds are better for the really strongly sorbed compounds, but not so good with the weakly sorbed compounds. Um, so it does require a little bit of uh, thinking before you get going. It's a good idea to have a conversation with your laboratory. Um, the, this is second nature, these kinds of decisions to people that work with these things all the time. But if you're new to the game, um, it's good to have somebody else um, involved. If you let them know what your compounds of concern are, what your target concentrations are, um, then the, that's pretty much all they need to be able to uh, guide you towards a good selection for your purpose. When it comes to the scope of sampling, um, you could consider, for example, initially mapping a uh, site uh, just to identify areas of interest. For example, if you are looking at soil vapor sampling, you could put a regular grid of passive samplers down and just look for hot spots like the heat maps that Brent showed a minute ago. Or you could do the same sort of thing with indoor air. If you've got a large building with a lot of different rooms, you could put passive samplers around and uh, identify areas of higher concentration by that. Or if you've got a VOC plume and groundwater that's going underneath hundreds of homes and you want to try to get an initial mapping of you know, which homes have a potential vapor intrusion signature, you could do an initial survey through uh, passive sampling just because it's so much um, easier to administer uh, than a, a summa canister sampling program. Um, and particularly when you're shipping large uh, volumes of samplers, it's, it, it, can, it can save you a lot of time and money. Another possible application of passive samplers is verification testing. 
after an initial assessment. If, for example, you uh, perform a traditional vapor intrusion assessment and find that there's you know, no unacceptable risks, uh, regulatory agencies might consider a second round of monitoring or, or maybe monitoring during winter conditions or, or something like that before making a final decision. But if you want to monitor in between, passive uh, so samplers are a nice easy way to get um, some data to help flesh out the, uh, the program in terms of giving you coverage over time instead of just a couple of spot measurements with uh, traditional uh, summa canister style sampling. Um, you could also use passive sampling for verification of mitigation system performance. You can um, deploy the samplers for indoor air quality monitoring, but if you use a passive sampler, you could also monitor the mass emissions from the vent pipe. Um, the airflow in the vent pipe can be at a high velocity, and so some samplers will suffer a positive bias from turbulent uptake um, by advection over and above the typical diffusive uptake. So um, a good uh, alternative for that is um, sampler that doesn't allow for advective uptake. The, the polydimethyl siloxane membrane on the water, the membrane sampler is basically like silicon rubber and as a result doesn't allow any advective flow and so it's a good uh, sampler for vent pipe monitoring. Um, also, uh, passive sampling is good for minimally invasive uh, screening. So um, if, for example, you have a building with high occupancy and you're worried about um, people looking at summa canisters and wondering what they are, um, oftentimes passive samplers are so small that they can be almost invisible um, and people walk right by them without even seeing them. So it just reduces the uh, the profile uh, in uh, settings with uh, public interest. Um, one important consideration is the duration of the sample. Um, the equation that Heidi showed earlier uh, where the concentration is equal to the mass divided by the uptake rate and time can be rearranged to solve for time. And if you substitute for the mass, um, the laboratory's mass detection limit, and use the same uptake rate, and instead for concentration just use the risk-based screening level, then what you'll calculate is the minimum duration of time that you need to leave the sampler in order to achieve a reporting limit in concentration units that's lower or equal to your risk-based screening level. And you want to make sure that that's um, occurring because you need to have a, a result that's sensitive enough. For example, if your screening level is one and you come back with a result that says less than 10, you can't really say, well, is it greater than one or less than one? So you need to have your reporting limit be lower than your screening level. Now for the Waterloo membrane sampler, there is a calculator uh, right on the website. You can just use drop down menus and decide whether you're using the low uptake rate sampler, the normal sampler, or the thick membrane sampler. Select a particular compound that you're interested in and what reporting limit you're trying to hit and just hit the calculate button and it will tell you how long you need to leave that sampler in order to achieve that reporting limit for that compound. So it's pretty easy to use and that's available on this website with the link here. Um, but to give you um, some examples on the next slide, I've uh, done some of those calculations for you. Um, so here, for example, is a comparison of benzene on the top chart and triclorothalene on the bottom chart. Um, the screening levels are in the first row, and so you can see the indoor air screening levels are lower than the soil vapor screening levels, and that's because of the attenuation factor between the two. Um, these are just numbers that would be picked from regulatory guidance documents. Now, with um, the radiello sampler, for example, you can either do thermal desorption or solvent extraction. The thermal uh, desorption is with the RAD145 cartridge, but that uses the yellow cylinder, which has an uptake rate for benzene of 27 mils per minute. Um, for solvent extraction, you use the white cylinder, and that's got an uptake rate of 80 for the same compound. So you can see there's a difference between the two um, in terms of the uptake rate. And there's also a difference, as I mentioned, with the sensitivity. The thermal desorption gets you a lower mass reporting limit and the solvent extraction somewhat higher. Um, but as a result of these differences in the uptake rate and the uh, mass reporting limit, even though the screening level is the same, um, the duration of sample collection needs to be a minimum of a couple of days with the RAD 145. And this is just rounded to the nearest day. Um, or it could be more like 10 days for the RAD 130. Now, in soil uh, vapor um, monitoring, with uh, solvent extraction um, by the waterloo membrane sampler, the traditional waterloo membrane sampler has an uptake rate of 2.2 for benzene mils per minute. And the method reporting limit is 0.2 um, micrograms, giving you a minimum sample duration of six days. 
Uh, with the low uptake rate sampler, you've got a slightly lower uptake rate to help minimize the starvation effect, and that means you've got a longer sample duration, in this case, 18 days. Um, with trichloroethylene, the analytical reporting limits are somewhat lower. You can see here 0.05 compared to 2, that's a factor of 4 lower. Um, 0.1 compared to 4, that, or 0.4, that's a factor of 4 lower. Um, again, 0 uh, 005 compared to 0 0.02. That's again a factor of four lower. And so um, that's basically because trichloroethylene has less of a concern um, with sort of background or ambient concentrations and blanks as benzene tends to with um, uh, the sorbent sampling analysis. So with greater sensitivity, you can have shorter sample durations. In this case, the trichloroethylene, you can meet these reporting limits, which are um, similar uh, in terms of the screening levels between the two compounds with uh, sample durations that are shorter one day and three days versus 10 days, or one day versus six days, or three days versus, versus 18 days. So that you can see then that uh, depending on which sample you select and what target concentrations you're trying to hit, you need to go through the decision of how long do I need to leave this in the field in order to uh, schedule your field crews for sample deployment and sample retrieval. Sampling protocols are actually pretty simple. Most of the passive samplers have uh, instructional videos on YouTube, and there's a whole series of links here, but if you if you just even go onto YouTube and just say passive sampling SKC or passive sampling 3M or passive sampling water or the membrane sampler, you'll get links to these videos. You can watch them. They're usually only a few minutes long. Basically, it's just take the sampler out of its container and expose it, and when you're done, put it back in the container and ship it. Um, there's a requirement to write down the time that the sampler was deployed and the time it was retrieved. And with um, sampling programs, there's usually chain of custody and other things like that. So it's, you know, got a, a few complications, but it's overly, uh, it, it, it's not overly difficult. And the learning curve is literally a few minutes. When it comes to soil gas sampling, there's a couple of options that I want to talk about just real quickly. One is um, to deploy them in such a way that you can do monitoring over time. And in order to do that, what you probably want to do is put some kind of installation on the ground that's more or less like a soil gas probe or a well. Um, this uh, image on the left shows a hand auger uh, that was used to auger holes that are a sufficient diameter for this pipe. The pipe has uh, basically something that looks like stilts on the bottom of it to keep the pipe from uh, resting on the bottom of the borehole. That leaves a void space into which the passive sampler can hang. Um, then there's a ring clamp around here with a plastic sleeve that's slightly larger diameter than the pipe and, um, and about the same diameter as the borehole. Um, once you put this apparatus into the borehole, then you can just put some loose sand into the annulus between the uh, pipe and the plastic sleeve, and that will create an annular seal. With a cap that goes on top that's got a hook on the inside, you can dangle the passive sampler down in the void space for the sampling program to begin. When you auger the hole, um, the sand that you take out of the hole or the soil that you take out of the hole uh, leaves a void, and that void fills with atmospheric air. So when you first install this, you should either connect a pump and purge the volume of, of air in the void space or um, leave it sealed and allow time for the void space to equilibrate by diffusion um, in dry soils that might only take a few hours in um, wet soils it might take overnight um, but that would um, and allow you to do the passive sampling in such a way that didn't have a negative bias from antecedent atmospheric air in the borehole and so you can see here with a surface completion you know you can drop the passive samplers on a fishing line down into the hole and just leave them for a specified period of time that we talked about on the previous slide and come back and retrieve them. It's a pretty straightforward sampling method. Um, you may or may not want to have a permanent installation and resample on multiple occasions. And if you only want to do a temporary uh, sampling, you can do that uh, through a hole that doesn't have any plastic pipe in it. Um, on the left here is a hand auger or a, a hand drill with a, a five foot long auger bit on it that can be used to drill a hole that's large enough diameter to drop in a water lip membrane sampler. And the way we normally do that is we drop the sampler in, um, it's surrounded by a wire um, coil that prevents it from coming into contact with the soil so that the membrane doesn't get dirty or wet. And after that, we put in a uh, pipe that contains um, a tube inside it that's got some foam rubber that is compressed. 
and a dowel is used to push that out of the bottom of the pipe. And then when the foam rubber expands, it creates a cork. And that uh, plastic uh, sleeve that contains that cork uh, remains up above ground surface, where it becomes a, a handy handle that, that you can just pull on when the sampling is done and pull on the fishing line that holds the water the membrane sampler, the whole thing comes out of the hole together. By doing this, you can have the cork um, at whatever depth you want. So you can do depth specific sampling as opposed to just having a cork at ground surface where you're pretty much sampling everything from the depth of the borehole to the ground surface. Um, if you wanna look just at a specific interval, then uh, being able to put the cork at whatever depth you want is a handy um, alternative. And that's also part of the patent that Brent mentioned earlier. Uh, when it comes to quality assurance and quality control, there are a few things you need to do in the field and in the lab. Um, the two key parameters that we usually worry about are accuracy and precision. Uh, for accuracy, uh, a trip blank is an essential part of any sorbent sampling program, passive or active. And basically, that's just a sampler that goes back and forth from the lab to the field and back without being uh, used as a sampler. And if for whatever reason, the samplers are exposed to some chemicals during shipping, then the trip blank will identify that. As long as your trip blank is clean, then you know that didn't happen. And if it did happen, but it was only for compounds that you're not concerned with, that's okay too. But if it does happen um, and the uh, concentrations on the trip blank are greater than uh, your screening levels, then you may need to you know, do some uh, blank correction or uh, possibly resampling. So it's a necessary QA, QC step. Um, another step that uh, we recommend whenever the highest level of data quality is required, for example, if the data are going to be used for risk assessment, is to do intermethod split samples, which is basically collecting side by side, you know, co located and coincident uh, samples by a different method so that you can then um, verify that the concentrations measured by the passive samplers are uh, accurate to the other method, or you can adjust the uptake rates for site-specific conditions to um, tune, tune the samplers basically to the most accurate level possible. The reproducibility of passive samplers is quite good. So if you do this co-located uh, calibration on say one in 10 samples, or maybe even one in 20, um, as long as the other investigative samples collected by passive samplers are collected under the same conditions, like in the same building or in the same type of soil, then you can use the um, calibration of one sampler to calibrate the others as well. They're very reproducible from one to the next. Um, in the laboratory, they do uh, blank testing of the media sorbent lot. So when sorbent is purchased, it's purchased in a big jar and that'll usually get tested. Um, there's usually also a method blank just to make sure that the analytical equipment is, is clean. Uh, laboratory control samples and surrogate recovery are part of every GCMS um, analytical accuracy um, program. Um, with precision uh, to assess variability, field duplicates and lab duplicates uh, provide that data and that's no different than what you see with active sampling. That's pretty familiar. When it comes to outdoor air sampling, uh, there should be some kind of shelter to protect the passive samplers from wind and rain. Um, and so there's a photograph on the right hand side that gives you an idea what those shelters might look like. Um, it's also a good idea to avoid um, hanging them in trees, for example, because anybody who knows about phyto remediation knows that trees can transpire, VOCs, uh, through root uptake and, and, and leaf transpiration. So you could have a positive bias in your outdoor air concentrations if you hang a passive sampler in a tree. Um, when it comes to indoor air sampling, it's good to do a survey for background VOC sources. This is no different whether you're collecting active or passive samplers. Um, you might consider relocating uh, interior sources in advance of your sampling program. Um, it's good to make sure that there's an adequate air circulation in wherever you're going to be deploying the samplers, um, but not excessive air circulation. So you want to keep the samplers away from vents and windows, but you don't want to put them in closets or cupboards. Um, and it's also advisable to measure the cross floor pressure gradient during the duration of the passive sampling um, to get an idea whether the building is inhaling, exhaling, or both, or maybe it's ambient, um, you know, neutral pressure throughout the sampling period. These assist in the interpretation of, of the indoor air quality data after the fact. And again, that's no different with active sampling as well. Um, another consideration is workplace environment. Passive samplers are 
used and have been used for 30 years in industrial hygiene applications. And usually when they're done uh, for that purpose, they're um, breathing zone measurements uh, and often they're just clipped to the lapel of the, of the person that's uh, being monitored. Um, now, if you do that kind of monitoring and the person is in a workplace environment, they may only have an eight hour long shift and that's not, that's not long enough to meet your data quality objectives. Um, you could just seal the sampler back up at the end of the shift and open it at the beginning of the next shift and do a sample over multiple shifts. Um, and that might be advantageous as well if what you're looking for is a long-term time-weighted average concentration for assessing carcinogenic risks. Um, and th this idea of wearing the sampler might actually be valuable for people that move around a lot, particularly from one air zone to another. Um, when it comes to industrial hygiene passive sampling, most of the passive samplers are actually deployed by the users. They're pretty darn simple. This 3M OBM sampler, for example, comes basically in a pudding cup and you just pop open the pudding cup, clip it to your lapel and you're sampling. At the end of the sampling period, there's a hard plastic cap that you snap over top of uh, the open opening of this sampler and, and you just put it back in the pudding cup and, uh, with a, a slip cap and ship it off to the lab. It's, it's literally that simple. So um, this provides a possible opportunity when it comes to monitoring residential properties uh, because it's feasible for residents to deploy their own samplers. And so some people who might decline uh, to participate in a sampling program because they prefer not to have sampling personnel traipsing through their house could actually uh, you know, be convinced to uh, engage in the program if they were doing the sampling themselves. Um, one thing to consider is acute health risks. Uh, we've been talking a lot about long-term passive sampling and you know that is advantageous when assessing cancer risks, but for acute health risks, you may be interested in shorter duration samples. Uh, for example, uh, trichloroethylene has been considered um, potentially um, active as uh, uh, in fetal heart malformation uh, during the first trimester of pregnancy and um, acute action levels have been set in the range of you know eight micrograms per cubic meter for a commercial setting in region nine. Um, you might consider just doing building pressure control testing if you deflate the building and you find that the concentrations don't get up to that level it's unlikely that they are ever going to and that could put the issue to rest but if you're not going to do that you could use passive samplers, and what I want to try to draw your attention to here is if you were to deploy a passive sampler for a 10-day period, but it had a concentration less than 0.8, then you know that there was no single day during that period of time that was greater than 8, because otherwise um, it would have added up to more than 0.8 for the total. And similarly, if you deployed it for 100 days, but this concentration that you measured was less than 0 0.08, then the same applies. You'd know that no single day within that 100-day period had a concentration greater than the screening level. Um, now, that doesn't provide you with rapid um, uh, information, and so it might be something that you're really just doing after you've confirmed that you don't think there's such a problem. Um, but this, you know, for buildings, for example, that have mitigation systems might be useful. Um, if you want to confirm that those are working, you could actually do four consecutive passive samplers of, you know, 91 day duration each and get 365 days worth of coverage with every single day being monitored, as opposed to a quarterly monitoring program where you have one day worth of sampling every you know, three months and therefore only four days worth of sampling out of 365 instead of 365. Now, in order to do that, you need a good strong sorbent and you probably need a fairly low uptake rate to avoid saturating the sorbent, but you also want it to be high enough to meet these reporting limits. So that's how you would design a program for uh, monitoring if you were concerned about acute effects. And when it comes to regulatory acceptance, there's really sort of three things that I think make all the difference. Um, number one, um, most regulators will uh, prefer uh, seeing some side-by-side -side data collected by conventional methods whenever they're um, embracing a new technology for the first time. It's not that difficult to collect side-by-side -side SIMIC canisters and it doesn't add that much to the cost of the program if you're only doing them on a say one in 10 frequency like other QAQC samples. Um, there's photographs here that show two six liter SUMA canisters that are um, chained together through a manifold to a single flow controller. That enables uh, two canisters to basically be stretched to uh, six day or maybe even seven day duration um, against a passive sampler uh, of a similar duration. That's one way for outdoor and indoor air sampling. And when it comes to soil vapor sampling, you just collect a conventional active sample to, to compare.
And if you take those data and plot uh, passive versus active and you see a good strong correlation, that'll usually help with your regulatory acceptance. And that also gives you field calibration. It gives you uh, the highest level of accuracy. Um, regulatory acceptance is also uh, facilitated by the abundance of um, published reports. This is a summary of the articles that we published from the STCP study. Um, as well as um, you know some technical reports, so you know this goes into passive sampling in a good level of detail for a wide range of different sampler types, and certainly helps. But if you want to get into the entire scientific literature, I think my um, bibliography of my doctoral dissertation was two or three hundred references. Passive sampling's been around for decades, and there's a whole lot of literature out there. Um, there's also regulatory guidance on the topic, and this obviously will help with regulatory acceptance. Um, not all of these guidance documents are in the United States. Not all of them are for uh, vapor intrusion assessments. Some of them are industrial hygiene related. Some of them are in different countries. But just the fact that um, regulators are uh, you know, embracing and adopting passive sampling for a variety of different techniques, there's ASTM standards as well um, that you know should help with regulatory acceptance. So. I think it's time to just wrap up and uh, present a few take-home messages. Passive sampling um, does simplify VOC assessments. Uh, there's proven performance, simple protocols, no moving parts, uh, no uh, risk of leaks. It can help you manage variability. Uh, the longer duration samples allow you to integrate over time, which uh, helps you manage temporal variability. But also the simple protocols result in lower risk of uh, operator error or uh, sampling variability. Um, if you want the highest level of data quality, benchmarking is recommended. You can do one in 10 samplers collected side by side uh, you know, with a duplicate uh, by Summa Canister TO15 for field calibration. There is actually a new flow controller, a capillary flow controller that's designed to allow a six liter Summa Canister to collect a 14 day sample. So field calibration is getting easier and easier. Um, and when it comes to passive sampling, this study design does take a little more thought. There are different samplers and they're different sorbents, they have different pros and cons. Um, so it's good to have a conversation with an experienced uh, you know, person in a lab who knows about these things before deciding um, which sampler, what sorbent, and what sample duration. And you know, going once around the block on what you're gonna do for quality assurance, quality control is a good idea too. But that's not really very time consuming and you're usually going to have to interface with the lab before a sampling program of any kind. So it's not a deal breaker um, and certainly the cost savings that are possible through reduced cost of shipping and reduced manpower for sampling can make it all worthwhile. So uh, passive sampling gets a big thumbs up and with that I think we're um, ready to entertain any questions. Uh, this is the end of the formal part of the presentation. Um, but now um, the authors are available for um, any questions. Thank you.